So today our first uh, seminar uh, will be very, very interesting because uh, this gentleman worked for the railroad and uh, is 90 years old and has a story or two that he would like to tell us. Tom, do you want to come up? Yeah. Uh, Incidentally, I'd like to thank uh, Tom. He's one and only that uh, put the banquet together today. Uh, you can all realize that there, it is a good effort. Thank you, Bob. Uh, like Bob said, Tom Burner, and I was assisted though by Don Evenson, another volunteer at Lake State, and of course Bob is there all the time, so he's always the backup uh, banquet coordinator. So our first presenter this morning today is Mr. Henry Gert, uh, who is going to be assisted by Mr. Paul Knudsen, as we did both of them are from the Lodi area, correct Paul? Henry from Madison. Oh, Madison, okay. And Henry initially hired on the Chicago Northwestern Railway in 1944 at 17 years of age, and I believe he initially hired us as a telegrapher. Is that correct? Yeah, is that correct? And, but then when it was determined that he needed to be 18 years of age in order to hold that position because of the fact that there was money involved and money transfers and that kind of thing, I guess, he was reassigned the next day to uh, be a signal maintainer. And then that career was interrupted for a while with a stint in the armed forces uh, during the, world, the end of World War II. So then Henry then, as Bob kind of mentioned, Henry we discussed his career with the Chicago Northwestern Railway, including his work as a signalman, initially maintaining kerosene-fueled signal lights. So without further ado, Mr. Gert. Well, you heard my beginning part of my speech. Yes, I started out as soon as I got out of high school. My dad was a telegrapher, the first telegrapher at Simon Junction on the new line on the Chicago Northwestern. And I learned to be a telegrapher from him. And uh, when I graduated from high school at 17, he first wanted me to get to work so I could stay in my room and board. So, uh, he got a hold of the uh, chief train dispatcher, Adam, Mr. Hintz, and also Ed Keith, Ed Keith, the chief train dispatcher at Madison, to get me a job. So Ed Keith said, send him over here. I got a job for him at being the agent and telegrapher at Barneyville. So I went over there, and uh, I got on a train. Uh, at that time, they had a, they had uh, what we call the Zinke train. It was a gas-operated passenger train. The Northwestern that I know of had three of them. One ran from Madison to Lancaster, one ran from Adams to Milwaukee, and one ran from Janesville to Fond du Lac. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the one from Janesville to Fond du Lac after a little bit. So I got out to Barneyville, he gave me the key, and I got out to Barneyville, and I opened up the deep road and swept the floor. There was no, uh, train dispatchers didn't have phones at that time out west. They didn't have them on the new line either, between uh, Butler and uh, Wyville. So uh, I got done sweeping the floor, and I could hear the train dispatcher calling me on the, on the telegraph, and, so I answered him, and he says, uh, uh, I telegraphed that I should get on the train when it came back to Madison and bring the key along. And I thought, holy Christ, I haven't even got the floor swept, and I'm, I'm fired already. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I did that, and I got there, and Mr. Key said, well, Henry, I didn't read your uh, application very good. It's my fault. He said, you're only 17 years old, and you handle... Western Union money, you handle Railroad Express money there at Barneyville, you handle passenger money, at, and uh, you cannot be bonded, so we can't hire you. And there's not another job in Wisconsin that does not handle money. We don't have the uh, climate junction of just operators, and that those three jobs are full. Wyville had three operators, that job was full. So they got me a job on the signal department. Climate. So I went to work in the signal department and uh, 
with the understanding that when I finished on the signal department and got to be 18, I would return as a telegrapher. And he said, you gotta promise me that. And he said, we need telegraphers. And I said, okay, that's the thing. So uh, I worked at the time and junction for the signal maintainers there, there was two of them. And uh, then I uh, got laid off uh, because of uh, no work. And uh, I enlisted in the United States Navy during World War II. So uh, I then went into the Navy and took my basic training at Great Lakes and got aboard my, and they wanted to make a radio operator out of me for night. So I, I don't care what I did in the Navy. So, but because I was a legacy, but that was, but I learned the Morse code. And in the service, it was not the Morse code, it was the continental code. And I didn't know anything about that code. And I, so then, then they found out that I didn't know anything about continental code. Then they just uh, assigned me to a ship and was, I went from Great Lakes to Long Beach, along uh, uh, Treasure Island in San Francisco. I got aboard my ship and then stayed there. I was on in the South Pacific without telling you anything about that. I was on the South Pacific for the rest of the war. Uh, and uh, so then when I come back home, I couldn't get a job. There's no jobs on the railroad. And, and finally, the signal supervisor, who was Madison, called me and said, they're putting on a gang and they're starting a big project in the Illinois district between West Chicago and Nelson. They're gonna start installing centralized tracker control. Now that section of the track was already had automatic train control. They were gonna put centralized tracker control over it. So they were gonna put on three crews, signal department crews, and we were to get that done in 18 months at $10 million. So uh, we went to work there. I worked there two years, and, when I, and I started out at Elburn, Illinois, on the crew and moved to Geneva, Illinois. And uh, we didn't get out of Elburn in two years. <laughs> $10 million was just about all gone already. We didn't, we didn't even get out of Elburn. We had a long way to go to Nelson. So uh, I worked down there, and uh, of course that was a, Northwestern train line and also the UP. And uh, uh, one time I was doing some work at Elburn, at, at the Geneva, and I was on a call with them. We had quite a few guys from Wisconsin. We had, uh, I think there were five guys from Adams and the Cedar came down there when I went down. A lot of people in the signal department from Iowa came down and also from uh, the Lake Shore Division up around Appleton and Fond du Lac because there's no work in Wisconsin. So anyway, and of course, you know, uh, Northwestern took care, uh, had the UP city train, passenger train, city of Denver, city of Portland, city of San Francisco, city of Los Angeles. And if you stopped one of them trains, you might as well go home. And that, that was, that was awful. So one day, I and a friend of mine from the field, we were up on a pole doing some work. And uh, we had to keep all the train circuits uh, intact in while we were doing the work. So we put jumper wires from one side of the pole to the other side to keep the train the, the circuit's working so the trains would not get train control. And uh, so we were working and all at once I heard a train whistle and I thought it was just <coughs> me. I got it all day long anyway. And pretty soon it whistled again and I just kept working and Frank and I were talking back and forth. And here comes the city of Denver. So what happened? Somehow, I, when I was working up there, moving around, my arm come around and I pulled the jumper accidentally off of the automatic change control circuit. And that city of Denver was coming. And boy, he got change control. And he come 
down in the Geneva, the brakes were set automatically and the sparks were flying and he was cussing and the train was going and I thought, and I said, oh, I said to Frank, you got the train control, I see, I got the junkies come off. And I said, well, no, anyway, I said to him, I said, well, I think I'll go back and join the Navy. <laughs> 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 so I got up. The next day, the signal, uh, the signal construction engineer, whose name was Mr. Biggers, and he was from out of Chicago, and he had charge of that big project. And we came the next morning, and we were in the camp car. We went to work at 7.30, he was there at 6.30, and I knew what he was there for. And I said, uh, he said, Henry, what happened yesterday? I told him, I said, and I said, just you want to can me? I said, I don't care. I, was I figured I was going to go join the Navy anyway. He said, uh, and he said, no. Oh, he said, I ain't going to He said, you had made a mistake. That's all right. Boy, I'm telling you, that was a load off of my shoulder. He said, what happened, happened. He says, uh, he says, as far as what happened, he said, the UP is very, very upset. And uh, he says, but don't worry about it. I'll take care of the Union Pacific. So I stayed with him until April 1st. In 1948, I got a job at Madison as the assistant signal maintainer. And that was the day, April Fool's, that was the day Mr. Ben Heinemann took over the Chicago Northwest. <laughs> <laughs> the bank up railroad, and he bought it and took it over. And uh, so I worked there for all that, for quite a while. And uh, then, and he hired uh, Mr. Provo uh, as the president uh, of the Northwest. And uh, he, when he took over, then I was also became the local chairman of the Signalman's organization. And I worked with Mark Ganeen, who was the local chairman of the union of the telegraphers union, Cook. And Provo started closing up all these stations in the state of Wisconsin. Closed them right up, laid off all the places. And the telegraphers went on strike on the Northwest. They went on strike for the whole month of September. Closed the Northwestern right down. There was not a train running. And I worked with Mark Benin on that, uh, organizing tickets and stuff. And uh, I found out later when I became the general chairman of the Chicago Northwestern that the uh, labor relations officer told me that if the clerks would, uh, the, the labor force didn't get to go back to work by the end, of, if they wouldn't have went back to work by the 1st of October, they would never open up the Northwestern. He was going to close them down and shut them down and never start them up again. But the clerks went back on the 29th of September and they didn't shut down. And uh, that was quite an ordeal, that stuff. And then when I went back, then I was, went back to work, and we had a lot of trouble on the Northwest. A lot of train trouble. They didn't have no signaling system because there's no train ran for 30 days. Not a train, not a switch engine, not anything, anything on the whole Northwestern Railroad. And then when they ordered the trains to start operating, well then the signal department had a lot of trouble. We had a lot of it. Because we did, they didn't have no train signals. Crossing signals didn't operate. The train would go by, the gates would stay up, the wigwags wouldn't go, the flashes wouldn't go. Because the train, the rail, rail was so rusty that when the train and the engine went over, it didn't shunt the track and it didn't activate any of the signaling system or any of the crossing protection. So, and we just about had an awful lot of accidents, so what we had to order done then is uh, order the superintendent to run train engines with a couple of cabooses and set the, and set the brakes and run the train and the engines and the cabooses with the brakes set, mm -hmm. so that it would 
take your rust off the rail so that the signaling system would work. And that was quite an ordeal there. Now, a signal maintainer, if you don't know, and, uh, I had this trouble when I was union representative on the uh, with labor relations. They didn't even know what a signal maintainer did. And they said, you guys don't do nothing. And, uh, they didn't. and that is true. A lot of people don't know. We, as a, in the signal department, we know what an agent does, the conductor does, the engineer does. But the signal maintainer takes care of all the train circuits. And uh, the train orders signals and the lights. Now, one night, I come back from the Navy and went, and I went back to climbing as a helper. I worked for two maintainers. And uh, one maintainer, he ran from Simon Junction to the east to uh, Butler. And we had signals. I don't know this picture. You'll see a picture right there, there on there of the signal and the bridge. Now, I still get shaky when I talk about this because I was just a little kid. I mean, I don't know him, you know. <coughs> and the maintainer would tell me, to, and I did every Monday to climb those signals, climb the bridge, and there usually were two signals on the bridge. Climb the signal bridge, and then climb that signal, and I'll take this here, can like this, with kerosene in it. And I'd be carrying that, my pockets were full of waste, of a, uh, and, and rags, and I'd have a pan to polish the blade, signal blade, and to polish the lenses, and uh, these, and this, this, this here has a, a pump in it that holds kerosene because there was no electricity at that time on the railroad. And, and so I would have to climb that bridge and that signal with this in my hand and a, a can of, uh, to clean the lenses and a box of matches and a long thing to put the match in and light it and you'd open this up here and and there's only one stand on that bridge you can see by that signal and i was little at the maintainer they was taller and bigger they could reach around and open this up and take the fount out and light it i couldn't do that because i wasn't big enough I would have to climb on top of that signal and sit up on top, way up here on top of that, <laughs> you know, with my feet hanging over this to try to reach to get that lamp, this lamp open, get that pound out of there. And I had this there with me and then reach over to get that, clean that blade and uh, the lenses on the signal. Oh, I'm telling you, and that was a long way up. And then nothing, just sitting there and trying to do that. Uh, I still get scared. I don't know how the heck I did it. <laughs> and then I would, uh, I, so I tried it once that I get tired of going up and down these things. And there was, there was always usually two signals on the bridge. There was always the eastbound and westbound, and you need a signal over here. So what I did, I come down, and I get off the ladder here, and then I cross over. Well, I tried that once. I got about that far, and I looked down, and I turned around and went back. I never tried this again. It was a I went all the way down to the platform, and walked over, and went up on that signal, and, and did it. I had to do that every Monday morning. Every Monday morning, I'd have to do those li li light it and uh, make sure that it kept burning and it didn't smoke because it had a, a glass fount on there. And uh, if that smoked, it would make it black, and then you couldn't, the uh, train crew couldn't, the engineer couldn't see the light, couldn't know what the, what the light the signal was. So, uh, that was a, I'm telling you, I was telling Paul. 
about some of these stories and where I said, if Asia was as long as they are now, I don't think the railroad would ever get built in John County. <laughs> we took so, it was so dangerous. And uh, it was because I, you know, when I took out, got married and took out a life insurance policy, I had to pay, a railroad person had to pay a higher premium because <laughs> it was, it was, railroad work was classified as a hazardous job. And uh, I know mine was hazardous, I didn't. And uh, so, uh, I was glad to get out of, uh, out of time. And see, on the new line, it was a funny thing, a new, they call it the new line between Jane, uh, Butler and Wyville. The old line was from Janesville to uh, Elroy, but uh, the new line did not have any electric lights like on the signals. They were all kerosene. Uh, the, uh, the dispatcher, there was no dispatcher, no dispatcher's phone. Every train order that you took from the dispatcher was by telegraph, uh, and uh, all the uh, Signal circuits were on the pole line, and uh, so the signal department, uh, we climbed a lot of poles and changed out a lot of poles, and we had a lot of poles burned down up in the Adams area and Wyville and the Cedar area by uh, forest fires. And uh, we did a lot of pole line work. And I had, uh, I know Paul uh, and my head of maintain, when I was a leading maintainer at Madison, I had two people work for me, and Tom Malin from Lodi was one of them, and we'd have to cut the brush underneath the pole line because uh, uh, they would interfere with the train, uh, signal circuits on the pole line because a lot of the wires were not insulated, and we'd short it out. So Tom, he would go there by Lake Mendota, and, along there and uh, cut the thermac down and all the trees down. And every time he had to do that, because every time he did that, the people there at Maple Bluff come out and cuss him up and down because he's cutting all them nice flowers down, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I got to do this. Oh, you shouldn't do that. I'm going to call the state. And oh, my gosh, he'd come back. He was in bad shape when he did that. <laughs> he was cutting all that thermac down. So, and uh, that was another thing about, uh, it's talk about the pole line. The lots of times, I don't know how many times, I mean, we, did, we changed out the line circuits in the pole and put new cloths on them. And I lost count of how many times that I was on a pole, not only me, but anybody that worked in the thing there. We tied it get up on the pole and we we soon be untied till we bought the, the, the cross on had ten insulators on the day. So each pole each cross on carried ten wires and uh, we would untie those wires and you didn't know the pole was broke. You didn't know if, uh, anything if it was uh, loose in the ground or nothing and because the wires kept it in. Climb up there and we'd untie it. I untie the wires, all ten of wires and as soon as I untied the last wire, the pole went down. And I was, in, and we were strapped in there on that pole, and we went right down with the pole. <laughs> and it wasn't too bad. Most of the poles were 20 foot pole. But when you was on a 35 and a 40 foot pole, that was quite a drop. <laughs> and you didn't know if you were going to get up or not. And you uh, went down with it. So uh, that was, uh, was a dangerous thing. And I know when I was down in, in, in Illinois on centralized traffic control, because that's when the first job after I got back from the Navy, uh, there, the pole, a lot of the poles were real tall. And in fact, the one place at Elburn, when I we were working at that pole, now the first pole I ever climbed, it was going to the, the track, side track, uh, the industry track went into a slaughterhouse right at Elburn. And them poles were 55 foot, 60 foot high because they had to have clearance for the, to get in there. And the foreman says, Henry, you gotta, we got to transfer those arms up there. And I said, up where? And he said, up on that pole. <laughs> I hadn't climbed a pole yet. I, didn't, I never climbed one. I was not climbing one. I never did because I wasn't thinking one. So I looked and I said, oh. It took me a long, long time to get 
up that hole. I'll tell you, I stopped three, four times. And, and, and I, I was shaking like mad, and I tried to put my belt on so I could stop and rest. But the foreman said, don't put your belt on. He said, if you break out, you'll break out and you come down, you'll slide down that three or so pole and you will just fill your stomach and chest with three or so and mm -hmm. take the skin right off you. So uh, I didn't do that. So anyway, I did as much work. But then I had to find that pole again three or four times. But when I went up in the morning, and I'm not kidding you, I was just so tired. If I was going to stay there all day, I took my lunch with me, and I ate up there on that pole. I wouldn't be able to go up and down that pole. I took my lunch right along with me and ate my sandwiches, strapped right in there. And another thing that was the more dangerous is in, in Illinois, uh, like in Wisconsin, or anything, because we didn't have uh, power on our pole, like 110 or 220. But in Illinois, because of the automatic train control, they had 440, I mean 440 volts. And the wires were always on the pins one and two, as far as the south from the pole, they were as far as the south. And those wires were number six bare co uh, copper wires. And, and you know, and this is working for the railroad. This is not working for the power company. I mean, the power company, when they did work like that, on that is anything 440 and above, they were furnished leather and rubber gloves, rubber line, and all the way up to their elbows, and then they had a rubber mat that they would put over the wires so if they ever touched them, it, it, it wouldn't get it. But we didn't have that on the, on the railroad. You just worked them with your bare hands, and you didn't have anything to cover them up. And uh, so that scared the hell out of me too. So when I was working, I'd always have the guy that was working with me there about every mile they, where they got to 440, they had fuse boxes up on the, on the cross on up on top of the pole. So I would have one of the guys go and pull the fuses and then that would kill the power, the 440, and would kill it. But it wouldn't hurt the uh, signal circuits or anything like that because that was mostly all DC power. And uh, so I got up there and started working, and I don't know, something told me to do something. So I took up there and I opened my belt and I leaned way over and I had these uh, wrenches in my belt and I took out my line wrench and I took it over and I reached over and I touched the wire and then and of course when I touched them both it just whoop. <laughs> and, and that's why I, I did that for the test if he pulled the pulled the fuses or not. And he did. I said, Yay, right thing, you didn't pull the fuses. What the hell you want to do? Show me. And he said, I did too pull the fuses. I went down there and I pulled so what he did, he went and pulled the fuses, but he pulled the fuses for the power going east and we were working west. So uh, <laughs> he killed it in the wrong direction. And it was a good thing that I tested that because holy smoke, darn it. So uh, it was some awful things that happened. And, uh, and another thing that uh, was fun, and of course Paul was an engineer. That's one, I don't know how many of you are engineers. The engineers on the Northwestern, they like to hit motor cars. I mean, they like to, if you had a motor car on it and they were coming, boy, they would like to make sure that it, they could hit it and knock it off. <laughs> uh, and if you got a motor car hit on the Northwestern, if you got a motor car hit by a train, you were automatically fired for years. And the main train I worked with at that time in Junction, he had two of them hit by the 400. And so he lost a lot of time. But I was, <coughs> I was uh, working Leaving Tiny for Dallas, right here at Bellevue. He was on vacation. And he wanted me to check the bonds, so I put the motor car on and I went to uh, North Freedom and turned the motor car around and I was going to, instead of walking the bonds, I'd go real slow with the motor car and then I'd watch the bonds and stuff. And, and the only way you didn't, the, the, the motor car would not chunk the track. 
as the train did. We, did, we didn't have no protection. We got a line up in the morning for the train dispatcher, and that was good for all day, it was good week. But at the bottom it says, remember, a train can run on either track in either direction. Well, that really means it. Man. I was through with it, that didn't do us any good. We knew that. But anyway, I was checking these bonds, and I was on the uh, westbound main, and I knew there was no train to it, but, but except the way freight. The way freight was uh, due <coughs> not too long, but I was, but that was a way freight out of coming from Elroy to Prairie Blue. So they would be on the eastbound main, so and I was on the westbound, so it didn't make no difference. I was going to it. And I was looking, and all at once, I, was, I looked up, and holy smoke, there's a train head like there, looking me right in the face and on my track, and I said, what in the hell is, and he was close, and I jumped off that motor car, and by gosh, you don't know how strong you can be when you're in an emergency. I mean, you get strength more than you ever know. I grabbed them on the uh, handlebars of that motor car, and it was a big, big, good size motor car, that was them. and I picked that thing up, and I literally threw that car off the track halfway and then I ran into the front and got the handlebars there where the motor was and threw that over into the, and here comes that train. And why I say, and, and, but I, I found out that uh, after this happened that the Roy Freight had orders from Reedsburg to run on the westbound main mm -hmm. to Baraboo. And, and I was on there, and on, I, I, so that's why that happened. We didn't know that. I did not know that he was, had permission to run the train. But here, that's a good thing with them orders, of course, they call them. They had, they had a 10 mile, the train had a 10 mile speed limit. He could only go 10. The good thing was only going, because if I knew the Northwestern, he was probably had it in first notch with it, took it, me and everything else with it. But, uh, uh, he, was, uh, he was under the orders for a 10 mile speed limit. So that helped me because when I seen that headlight coming, he was pretty damn close. And, uh, and uh, so I got, but it wasn't too bad yet. I got the motor car off and nothing happened. And I'd say a couple seconds on me. I, I never knew how that strong in my life that I could do that. But it took me two and a half hours two and a half hours out there to get that motor car back on the track. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take me long to throw it off, but it took me two and a half hours to get it back on the track. So, uh, that, uh, things like that happen to us all the time. And anything else, Paul? Um, how about the batteries? Oh, the batteries. You know, uh, the batteries, like I say, we didn't have power on the Northwestern, but all the signaling circuits and the cross bell circuits were operated on DC current. It was an AC, a DC. And uh, we made like a, we take a, like a set of flashes, I'll use that and we get a set of flashes at a crossing. And I had a couple of them when I was maintaining. And uh, they op uh, operated on DC circuits. And we had, uh, for a set of flashes that are crossing, you had to have mixed up 40 cells of battery. Now, a battery consisted of a, about a gallon and a half glass jug. And you filled that full of water, and you had a can of caustic soda, and you opened that can of caustic soda, with a knife, and you put it in to the water, and you stir it, and you stir it, and you stir it, and you stir it. Forty of them. And then you put uh, an element, it was uh, elements of copper and zinc. It was a brass post going, and you put that in that solution. And that, you made forty of those, about every nine months to operate a set of flashes at a highway crossing. And the signals were operated that way too. But there you had 60 to 
80 cells, mm -hmm. and we'd have to make those things for that, for that too. Uh, that is, if it was a thing would be specific. And so, uh, you had, and then the, the battery consist, uh, made uh, about seven tenths of a volt. That's all it was. So that's why you had to have so many of them to, uh, and you put them in series to get it up to operate the uh, DC motor on those flashes. Mm -hmm. And we had also signals like that that didn't have no power and, and operated on uh, on DC, <coughs> the motor was DC circuit and operated. There, you usually had 80 uh, cells of that. And usually at every signal, at the first like that, there was a tub by the, by the instrument case, so with all this material, they had an 80, they call them 80 cell tub. Huge, big, around like that, went down about 12 feet down into the ground, 80 cells, all cement. And they had shells in there, and we uh, that held all the, all the battery. <coughs> and uh, this is another good story, I think. Oh, everything happened to me. I had all kinds of fun. I was working with the uh, maintainer at, at uh, Simon and uh, setting up a cell a battery. And you had a, he made them outside on the ground, you know, all these, and then you usually take about 20 of those batteries out at a time and then make 20 and put 20 new ones in and take another 20 to the set them. And you had a rope and a lift that you put these batteries on and you pick it up and, and drop it down into the tub and then it, you could work it and it would make it loose and you pull it up again and get another one and you drop down about seven or eight of those batteries at a time and then you climb down and put them up on the shelf and hook them up. But once in a while, you know, you get smart and you get lazy and you want to do it faster. So what some of us would do once in a while, we'd just pick up the battery with our hand and have, and if you had somebody with him, I had the maintainer with me, he'd go down into the tub down there and then I'd pick up the battery and hook it up, lift it up over the neck of the tub and hand it to him and he'd be on the ladder and he'd take it and then go down and put it on the shelf. Well, I was doing that, and what I did, I hit the bottom, the neck of the tub, at the bottom of that cell bed that was down in the asphalt, this asphalt, mm -hmm. and it tipped over, and all that acid ran right down his head and down like that. Mm -hmm. uh. Well, and he came out of that tub fast and had a gopher coming out of the dog on the hall, I'm telling you. And, and I just, took, the only thing I could do, I, I, and, and I would carry water, I would carry water, you know, it's a uh, uh, milk uh, can. No, we had two or three milk cans full of water because we didn't have water there. We had to all bring that with us on the motor thing. So I had another pail of water and I put it on it and I just took it and I just, Pale after the trusted and got all that acid off of it for it and did any damage. But uh, it's uh, run into a lot of interesting things. Uh, and although when you dump the old solution on the ground, it doesn't get a problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, this, was, this is a good. <laughs> I was uh, out in Huron, South Dakota, working for the maintainer there. I'll tell you a story about Huron, the maintainer of Huron, South Dakota. He was from Nasida. And he was working, the gang was working at Adams. And uh, 484 was, went ahead of, they were waiting for 484 to go by and they put the motor car on to follow them. They were gonna go to Oxford. And uh, 484 went by and uh, they followed them and then they were on the five of them on the motor car on that gang. And a break rigging fell off a of 484 and stuck in the tire right by the uh, overhead 
I'd like to have is I think it's over 151 districts west of Oxford. And that motor car hit that, and they went flying. They just derailed, and a motor car just went flying. And they have four guy, five guys, signalmen on that. On that. And one guy was Guy Horton, and he lost his leg. Uh, Charlie Sweet was from Adam. He was blind for over a year and in the hospital. And the other three didn't get hurt too bad. So anyway, when Guy Horton got out of the hospital, they fixed him with a wooden leg. And of course, he couldn't climb poles or anything, so he didn't, they couldn't give him a job. And he made a settlement with the carrier. And so finally, he got a job. A job opened up here in South Dakota. It was 500 mile territory, but he didn't have no pole line. He didn't have to climb any poles. He just had to take care of the crossing protection, we go eight and flashes. And uh, I stopped up at the I was up stop at the scratches office when I was in Madison and pick up a line up to get any messages at the, from the train dispatch. And I went up there and, I, and Ed Keith said, here, Henry, I got a message for you. And I don't know what it's all about. I never see such a doggone message in my life. And it was a message from Guy Horton to Sam Searles, the signal supervisor. And the message said, broke my leg, I repaired it, and no time lost. <laughs> <laughs> and Ed T said to me, what in the hell kind of a message is that? And I was laughing, I was laughing, so then I thought, God, they put So I said, I'll take it, Mr. Keith, and took it down to Sam, and I said, here, got a message for you from Guy Horton up in here. And he looked at it, and he was just all tilted. But he did, he, he fell off of the big leg and broke his the wooden leg and he nailed it together. <laughs> 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 it went to see right at work and he sent a message that uh, broke my leg, but I prepared it and I still no time lost. <laughs> so that was uh, uh, really something that was good. And, uh, yeah. What was that? Yeah, that's about when you dumped the old oh, battery. Yeah. And then I was there at this crossing and I had a wigway and it had 40 cells of these batteries I had them set up to operate this way. So I set up these batteries. <coughs> and of course, the, uh, taking the old ones out, you take out the batteries and you throw the solution. I don't know how to throw the solution around the, the battery box or the instrument case or whatever to kill the weeds, because that was after, that kill anything. So I was there at, outside of, uh, in, in South Dakota anyway, and this wigway was right there by this pond, and I set up the batteries and did everything I was supposed to do, and everything was good. And, and uh, I stayed there that week, and I got Guy Hoyt came back from vacation, and I went back to Madison. And Sam Phillips called me and said, Come on in the office. And I said, okay. I went in anyway. So I went in, and he says, You're in trouble. I said, what did I do now? He said, you killed 20 pigs in South Dakota. You set up some batteries at this crossing, the operating van. I said, yeah. And you spent all that acid you sprinkled on the ground and all ran into the pig yard where the pigs were and they ate that. That acid and killed 20 of the pigs. I have more fun. <laughs> I didn't get fired though, I, I mean, that, 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 but they, I'm telling you, I never lived that down for a long time. And every time I went out to Huron uh, and, and relieved that maintainer and at water council, uh, those section men, they knew who I was and they said, uh, you want us to come along so you where the farms are so you don't, <laughs> you don't kill, any, kill any cows or, or any more pigs. So that was uh, that was another good uh, good thing that uh, uh, I had run into. But it was, uh, and then we uh, and I, I don't know, and we, uh, another big job we had here in Wisconsin is that we single track from. Uh, and uh, Evansville, Wisconsin, to Madison, and then also from Madison to Elroy, up to this way. And I was a game for them, and then that happened. And uh, we, had, we had a lot of people working here, here then. And then we, and all the, uh, all the signals that the family 
exchange and all the signals had to be moved. And so that was a, a, a very big job. Uh, and when I, I, as I said, I was uh, elected as a local chairman that took care of the people in the Madison district and from the state domain banners and the signal department employees as their labor representative. And then in 1969, uh, we had 300 signal department employees on the Southern Northwest. And they elected me to be their full-time labor representative on the signal department. So that was a full-time job, and I represented the, the, all the signal department employees on the Southern Northwestern, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, Nebraska, Illinois. And the Green Bay and Western also had the Green Bay and Western. And I uh, did that. I worked on the signal department before I became a full-time, 25 years. Uh, full-time, 25 years I had on the signal department. Then when I got this job, I had this job as a uh, union representative. I had, was elected and I had that job 20 years so when I retired, I had 45 years of uh, wow. seniority. And when I was elected, uh, and I had, I was, I had a bad temper uh, when I was young. And, and I was going to conference, you know, and I, and I was going in conference. I was just a high school graduate, and I was up against these lawyers, you know, labor relations case that I dealt with, one was a lawyer and one was a lawyer's clerk. And uh, I didn't get along too good with them as I started. But finally we got in a bad argument. I was in there with my vice general chairman, he was the main chairman from Detroit. And uh, Joe Freeman was this lawyer and he he would get mad at me. He, but he just there was many times he said, Chris, either you get out of this office, you son of a bitch, or there's going to be trouble. I mean, that's the kind of language he used. <laughs> All the time. So he left, and Mr. Kiley came over and said, Henry, you know, you can get a lot more things with sugar than you can with vinegar. And I, I and that just that stopped me, and he left, you know, and I, and I thought about that and going back from Chicago to Madison on the train and in my office the next day and I said, well, maybe he's right. So I changed my whole attitude at that time. And uh, it did, it worked, it was right. I mean, it, it, they were right. And uh, there was, I did accomplish a lot and I, uh, like those signals. So that stand, one of the more, and climbing that there was one of the dangerous things. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I made sure that the Northwestern changed. I met, after I got squared away, I would have, every year I would have a meeting with Mr. Provo, the president of the Northwestern Railroad. He wanted to know, because, you know, he did it wanted to know what the signal department did and what it was. And uh, and I was telling Paul on the way up, we had, we bonded tracks, you know, and you had a thing you clamped onto the rail and you drilled it with your hand like this to drill a hole into the rail to put a bond wire on. And we were in, I was in a meeting with uh, all the general chairmen, because I was also the chairman of the Northwestern General Chairman's Association. And uh, Mr. Cole was talking and he said how they were going to get more productivity. We gotta get more productivity off the employees. And they had a slide program. And here's a slide there of a signal maintainer with one of these machines, Paul says he's got one in the big drilling on cramped under the rail, drilling. And when Mr. Cole asked those questions, I said, you want to talk about productivity, Mr. Prover? I said, go back to that picture where you see that maintainer drilling that hole on it. So they did. It. And I said, and this is 1970. And I 
says, I used that when I went to work in 1944, and you want productivity? I said, you got Matthias doing stuff. And 30 years later, the same way you was doing the study years before and longer. And I said, in that productivity? One month, every one of them we seem to learn. <laughs> and he got, got electric drill that he took and changed the bonding wire and everything all completely. And, uh, and that's what, and one time I worked in a signal shop at Proviso and uh, it was the administration building and I worked down there and that was flooded all the time when it, we got rain. And, 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 and there was there about 13 or 14 signal maintainers down there working. And they were sitting on stools and on chairs like you're sitting, and they had water up to their knees. And it was, and that was all electrical stuff down there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were dealing with all electric, and I, and uh, I met with Mr. Provo, and I, and I, I told him about it, and he said, oh, you foolish you go, there ain't no such a thing as that. I said, what are you doing? One of these days, he says, well, he said, making a point, why? And he says, I want to take you down there. He says, okay. So he was making an appointment with my clerk, and, and so we made an appointment in two days, and he says, I'll meet you there at nine o'clock in the morning. And I said, I'll be there, Mr. Provo. So I went down to the shop, and I told the guy, I said, Mr. Provo's going to be down here at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. And uh, he said, okay. So I went down there at uh, 8 o'clock and uh, went in and I said, uh, I'm going to stay and wait for Mr. Provo. Oh, he's been here already. And I said, what? Yeah, he was here at 6 o'clock. I said, it's time for that. So anyway, he was, and then he came back and he said, and he, he, and he says, you know something? I never knew this was here. I, I'm the president of this railroad, and I didn't know that this facility was here in the condition it was. And I said, yeah. I said, one of those maintainers could have been electrocuted or fallen when you have this water coming in, and you would have some awful uh, lawsuits against you. And he said, yes, I know him. He said, thank you. And uh, so that. Uh, so I got along, I got along with uh, Mr. Provo, and then Mr. Wolf became the president, and I, I got along with him, but I went a lot of, uh, uh, on his special train, every time he had a special train, he would always invite me to go with him. And, uh, and I, I went, I had, uh, with Mr. Wolf, uh, I wanted to go out to the coal track. They got the permission to go into the coal track at Wyoming. And I wanted to go out there and see it. So they flew me out to, uh, to uh, Mason City and they had a special train and I and Mr. Polk, who was a superintendent on the that district, and a couple other of us took the special train. And uh, I tell you, this is the engineer and that train was an assistant vice president of the Northwestern Railroad. And his name, and some of you probably know him, was Mr. Burkhart. <laughs> he was the assistant president. And he was the engineer, because he was an engineer before he went into being an official. And the reason I bring this up, you know, Mr. Burkhart, and I know he was a labor leader. He, he was. He was no good. I didn't get along with him at all. Uh, he and I did. And he became the president and, and took over Wisconsin Central Railroad and uh, ran that Wisconsin Central for a long time until we sold it. And then, as you know, he bought a railroad. Where was it? Iowa? Yeah, Canada? Yeah. In Canada. Yeah. Well, no, it was, yeah, it was a Canada. Okay. Bought that railroad in Canada. And the engineer, when he got, he ran out of time and, and, and he would stop the train and, and, and <coughs> I don't know, he didn't catch it. But anyway, it was his railroad and it was because he came.
kept this engineer working over the hours of service law that he didn't get the chance to do what he was supposed to do. And it was that train that broke loose and went down the hill and burnt up and started a fire and burnt this town <coughs> right down to the ground, the whole town. That was his railroad. And uh, it didn't surprise me a bit when I seen that in the paper, that he was the owner and the president of that railroad. And of course he was all down the railroad and then he was just bankrupt bad because of how he had suffered he had. Yeah, go ahead. I, well, if the, anybody wants any questions. The, our dinner will be uh, waiting. Okay. I'll tell you folks, we have a lot of history at Lake States on our shelves. We just had a history lesson. It's not on our shelves. However, we are recording for the first time in 12 years or something because we had people that said they wanted to be here but they couldn't make it. Are you recording it? So we're going to see if that works. Uh, fantastic, Henry. However, I'll give you one minute because I didn't hear anything about the new line and the old line. On the Northwestern, can you can you well, give yeah, us a little bit new, on that? Yeah, the new line. I, I couldn't understand that. You know, they called the new line from Janesville to uh, uh, from uh, Butler oh. to Wyville, the old line from Janesville to uh, Elroy. Now, on the old line, you had depots, you had dispatchers, uh, running water, running water. <laughs> Toilets, electricity. And electricity, and everything. That's your line. The new line, there wasn't an inside toilet all the way from Wyville to, to, to <coughs> Butler, and they didn't have some of them didn't have no electricity, and there wasn't even a dispatcher's phone. I mean, everything was by code, and 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 they called that the new line. And and I couldn't built, understand what later. the hell they were we talking about, you know. And I started on the new one at Time and Junction because my dad was the first telegrapher uh, when Time and Junction started up as a, 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 a power plant. And uh, that's where I learned everything at Time and Junction. And that was the new line. And I could never understand that. And I had a kind of damn signal to light these things on the new line and electricity was... Uh, that, I, that, I could never understand that. You know? And everything was... Uh, a lot older on the new line than it was on the old line. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and of course the new line, and there's still a, there's only double track from Butler to Time and Junction, and uh, from Time and Junction to Wyville, it was single track. And it, that's how far behind that, that everything was on, on the new line. But, uh, but it was built about 40 years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It took a while to catch up. Oh, yeah. it did. Yeah, that, that was the new line. And of course, that sort of 400 man. And, uh, I'll tell you one story on the 400. I was, I had a, because I was the relief man and I could, I had special passes. And I could run, I could ride the rear end of the uh, observation car, I could ride the engine, I could go ride any place on the uh, passenger train on the 400. Passes were no good on the 400 for regular employees. They were, they, you couldn't ride the 400, 400 and 401. You had to have a special pass from, from the superintendent. But I had a pass that I could ride anything. So I would get on a lot of times at Adams. And I had lived in climbing. I was looking to get off at the South Beaver then. So the first time I did this, I could get up and said, the engineer, I showed him my pass and said, okay, come on, get on board. I said, I want to check the light. He said, oh, that's pretty good on the signal light. So I got up and I went over there. There was a stretch of track by Vando. And I ain't not kidding you. I was standing behind that engineer and we were going 110 miles an hour. And I could see that on the dog on speedometer. 110 miles an hour. And I looked ahead and here we're coming to a curve. And I said, oh my God, we're going to go right, sure as hell, right into that cornfield. You never go around it. He cut it down to 90, and boy, he just went around that curve, that's like that. 90 miles an hour. <laughs> Whew. I thought, sure, we're going to go right straight, never curve, and go right out in that cornfield. 
that was that was really something. That was a good train. Okay. Well, what do you think?